So an application is close to done. There are a couple of things that I want to wrap up in this video, including a good user experience for when the user comes to the login page and when the user is on a book page. What I want to first fix is this login page. Can I have a better, uh, better UI for it? Again, I'm going to go for Bootstrap and pick some component, which is, um, which is good for the home page. Usually the jumbotrons are pretty good. Don't seem to see a jumbotron here. Let's take a look at the example. Something like this, like the hero. Uh, this is good. So I'm just going to copy this HTML, whatever renders this stuff. Right. Copy inner HTML. And I'm going to paste that in my index.html. So here is my uh, bare bones of HTML over here. I'm going to add this stuff here so that it's a nice jumbo V4, all right? So that they get a good welcome message, all right? So here I'm going to have some kind of a, a markety tag. Uh, control your reading habit. Track the books you read and show your, all right. Um, I'm not too happy with it, but that's okay. That's fine. That's not a problem. All right. So I have a button here. Uh, I'm going to make this an anchor tag because this is going to be a link for them to log in. And then the href is going to be this guy, right? It needs to be a link to go to GitHub and authenticate. Okay. And then this one's going to be login via GitHub. Okay. Um, can remove this part here. Now, our home page. Of course, once I add the bootstrap styling, it's going to look good. I hope. All right. I'm going to get this, the bootstrap CSS and JS. I guess the JS is not necessary here because we're not using any of the JavaScript stuff. It's mainly CSS. But, uh, yeah. Okay. So this is. I'll put this in a container. I think it has to be in a container or something like that. Let's take a look at what is, what is on the top. Okay. So this one's a main. I'm going to put a main here, container. I'm going to make the text center so that everything on the page is centered. Ah, oh, it has to be class. Okay. That's better. Let's take a look at what else we can do here. I am going to get the search part over here so that if somebody is, um, is not into logging in, they can just directly go and search. So I'm going to copy this part and I give them an option or search for a book. So they, if they choose to not log in, well, they can just search for the book instead, right? So I'm going to remove this anchor tag, put this here. Let's see. Okay. Which is not bad. I'm just going to have to fix the, the padding so that this is, you know, the margin so that it's spaced out a little bit better. I'm going to create a style here and I'm going to call a class dot space and I put 30 pixels. Okay. And, uh, I'm going to have a space bottom here, a space bottom here for the button itself and a space bottom here for search. Okay. This is good enough for me. 
I have a homepage where people can either click a button and log in via GitHub and they get to the dashboard or if they don't want it, they can just go, well, that DR is not applicable anymore. If they don't want to do that, they can just do a search and they're going to get to the search page. So that's cool. Now, the other thing that I want to do is uh, have some kind of a UI here so that when somebody is uh, not logged in and they're looking at a book, they get to see that, you know, they need to log in. If you log in, they're going to get the ability to do start date, completion date, and all that stuff. Right now, the user has no idea that they can do it if they haven't logged in, all right? So if I were to create a new uh, window, new private window, and over here, if I copy this URL and paste it here, right? This is the user hasn't logged in and there's nothing here, right? If I go to the home page, well, they're going to get this, but when they're in the, in the book page, there's nothing that tells them that they can get some more goodies if they were to just lock it. So I'm going to go fix that. We'll go to book.html. And uh, this is the form that I'm showing if there is a login ID. Now, what do I do if there isn't a login ID? Well, I can give them some messaging. I'm going to go to index.html and copy this, this thing here. And then uh, paste this in book.html so that it shows up over here, just above the form. Okay. Uh, I don't think I need a space bottom here because, you know, it's uh, pretty much at the very end here. And uh, this needs to show up if there isn't a login ID. All right. So I'm going to stick this here. Now I refresh this and I see this button here. Actually, let me add another paragraph here, which is uh, so maybe display six, which tells them why they need to log in. Right? Let me make this display six. Log in to track this book. Okay. And I'm going to make this uh, not a button large, makes it a little bit smaller. Okay, this one's pretty big as well. All right, this will do for now. I'm not gonna, you know, mess around with the CSS too much. But uh, now what you have is a homepage and the ability to log in, in the, from the book page. I can click here and log in from the book page. And now since I'm on um, incognito mode, it doesn't recognize my GitHub ID. So it's asking me to log into GitHub, which I'm not going to do. But if you were logged into GitHub, it would just, it would just automatically log you in. All right. So this is the, the couple of things that I wanted to do in terms of kind of navigating through the flow of the UI, like somebody who hasn't logged in, like what would their experience be? Well, there are two places in which we can show them that they need to log in. One is in the homepage. And the other is on the page of the book itself, like where they want to track, they can click a button and then log in right there. All right. So this is uh, the app. I am going to go back here and then make a couple more small changes. If I go to form.xml, I am going to call this Better Reads. Because that is the app, um, not GitHub auth template. And then finally, I'm going to make a couple of small tweaks to the way in which this code is organized, just some basic cleanup stuff. And I'm going to add some comments so that somebody who is reading this code can kind of understand what's going on behind the scenes. I'm going to clean that up and upload this to GitHub. I'm going to provide a link to that repository in the description so you can check this out get the code see the previous comments and follow along if you're trying this out and then your code isn't working well you can look at the github repo and see what's the difference and then try and patch that up pretty much all of the code except for some minor css issues pretty much all of the code that you know is in this repo has been written on video right you see me write pretty much every line of code 
in this project. So I'm hoping it's very useful in terms of trying to follow along and trying to do this yourself. Okay, since I paused recording, I've made a couple of changes to the code base. One of it is purely stylistic, very small tweaks to the UI. For example, I did a tweak in this UI, which you probably barely noticed. Just got this thing uh, a little bit below. And then in the books page, I have changed the login section to be another bootstrap card. I have a login to track the book for people who have not logged in, give them a small helpful message, and then there is a login via GitHub button, all right? These are the only two changes that I've made. This is, by the way, an example of a book which has a description and that description shows up in the UI. So far, we've been looking at books test, random books which didn't have a description. So this is what it looks like with the description. I didn't change that part, but just as is, I just changed this part to, um, to show the login call out in a nice card. Uh, the other change that I've done is to uh, add some comments, okay? So if you look at uh, some of these classes, I've added some comments over here to kind of tell you what the what the class is about, all right? So uh, if you're going through the code base, you're reading the code later, hopefully this is going to give you some information about these key classes and uh, what they're doing, what they're for, some brief description about some of these important uh, classes, right? So some comments over here. That's um, pretty much it. Also, I did a README, but um, apart from that, nothing, nothing of significance. So I'm going to push this to GitHub and I'm going to make the repository available in uh, the description of pretty much every video in the series. So you should be able to get to the repository and follow along. There are two repositories here. One is the uh, data loader repository, which is what we used for getting the, the, the bug data that we downloaded from the Open Library API and pushed it to Datastrax AstraDB. And then the second repository is this Bitterreads web app, which is a web application which fetches from it and provides this UI. Uh, both these repositories will be available in all of the descriptions, so definitely check it out if you're, if you're following along this video. This leaves one last thing that we need to do. And um, there's also probably a question in your mind, and I want to address that too, okay? What's the last thing that I want to do? Well, I want to go back to the Better Reads data loader and tackle the question, when am I going to go push all of the other books to, uh, to Cassandra? We just did like 50 books, right? We had this thing here, limit of 50. Now, how about we just push everything? Well, I'm actually going to do that now, right? I'm going to get all of the, the bulk data that we have, and I'm going to push that all to uh, Cassandra, to Astra, and then that's going to be available for, for people to use. Uh, but here's probably a question on your mind. Well, Kashik, there was one other feature that you mentioned that you forgot to implement, which is when you load the book page, well, we were planning to have the author link be author be a link, right? The name of the author be a link. And then when you click on it, you see all the other books by that author. Well, I talked about the design to do this. You're going to have to have a, a separate table, which essentially a separate table for storing all the books given an author, right? So given an author ID, I'm going to push all the book information there so that when we load an author page, so for example, when I click on this, it's going to go to just like we have books slash book ID. It's going to be authors slash author ID. And then it's going to fetch data from the authors by ID table, a separate table. Right now, what we have is just temporary storage for author names at all, right? We're not storing anything else. So it's going to be a separate table where each row is going to be an author ID and book information. And it's going to be kind of one author ID mapped to many books. This basically means that every book that I store it actually has to make a copy of it, right? It has to store a book information twice, one in the books by ID and the other for books by author ID, okay? So basically doubling the amount of data that's going to go out of my machine and into Cassandra. Because of that reason, I've decided to kind of do a rain check on that thing. You kind of know, now that you've been following along, you kind of know what it takes to create an author by, you know, page 
where you're storing all of the author information. If you want to give it a try, definitely give it a try with the test data that I'm going to supply to you. But as far as it comes to uploading all of the books in the world twice, I'm going to be like, no, once is enough, right? I'm going to just upload all of the books once so that I fill the books by ID table, but I'm not going to do the author uh, by books by author ID in the series. You're welcome to give it a try if you're so inclined to do so. Now, now the question is, how do I upload all of the book information? Well, all I need to do is remove this, right? If I remove this, it is basically going to get all the book information line by line. It's going to start pushing this to Cassandra. But there is a better way. What we're doing here is just reading one by one, and then it's sequential. Now, Cassandra is a highly scalable, highly available database which can really perform well under load. All right, so it can handle a little more than just me sending one record at a time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to split this work and I'm going to have this run in parallel. How, you might ask? Let me show you. So I'm in this directory where I have the, the file which contains all of the work information, all right? So one thing I can do is split this file into multiple smaller files and have separate processes work on those smaller files and start sending it to uh, Cassandra. That makes it faster, right? So if I were to open this file in VI, so here is the file. And then if I were to go to the end of the file and uh, look at the number of lines. So here is the number of records we have. And this is the amount of data that I'm going to be uploading to uh, Datastats Astra DB and Cassandra. If we take this number and split this by 10, we have about this much records, right? So what I'm going to do is make this an even number, 2245500, zero, zero. okay? I'm going to quit this. And then I'm going to use the split command to split this file into those many numbers, all right? So split, and I am going to pass in an argument dash L, which is basically how many lines should each fragment, each portion have. And then the number of lines is this much, okay? And then if I hit enter, what this is gonna do is it's gonna split this big file into smaller files, and now I can use these smaller files and have separate processes to work on them. Okay, so it looks like it's done. Now if I were to do uh, ls, here are all the files that it's created, all right? xaa, xab, xac, all the way to xak. Okay, now that's the first step. Next step is to pass these as arguments to our Spring Boot app. If you remember, our data loader Spring Boot app. Well, one good thing we did was we parameterize the location of the file. You see, we were able to get the location of works from a configuration value. Okay, so we were able to go to application.yaml and then we were able to specify where the files were located. Well, it's still coded in the file, right? It's still coded in the code base. How do I pass it as an argument? Well, this is where the benefit of the configurability of Spring Boot comes into the picture, right? Spring Boot allows you to specify these values in multiple different ways. One of the ways you can specify it is by passing command line arguments. So that makes it really, really interesting. What I can do here is I can get to the location of this Spring Boot application and I can use the Maven Spring Boot run target to run this from the command line, but I can pass an override to these properties directly from the command line. Well, specifically, I just need an override for this guy, right? Datadump.location.works. I'm going to have to pass in a different value for each time I run this. And I'm going to be doing this 10 times. So each time it's going to have a different value. All right, so let's do this. I'm going to navigate to this data loader app. And now here I can run the Maven command to run the Spring Boot application. So I can say dot MVNW, which is invoking the Maven wrapper in order to run the Maven command. So I don't have to install Maven even, right? I can just run Maven directly 
from the Maven wrapper. And now I can run the command spring dash boot colon run. And what this is going to do is it's going to run the Spring Boot run target on Maven, and it's basically going to start the application, which is basically what we did, right? We started the main class and then started the Spring Boot application. But now what I'm going to do is, instead of running it as is, in which case, if I just run it as is without passing any arguments, all the arguments are going to be whatever it is over here, right? It is the value of the properties that's specified over here in the application YAML file. But I can specify an override by saying, okay, data dump location needs to be not this guy, but one of those XA, XAB, XAC, and so on, all right? So here's how we can override it. I'm gonna go here. I can override it by specifying the arguments over here. I'm just gonna specify dash D, spring dash boot dot run dot arguments equals, and now I can specify key value pairs to say what are the keys that I need to override, all right? So I'm gonna say dash dash, what's the key here? What is it that I need to override? I need to override data dump dot location dot works. So that's what I'm going to put over here. Data dump dot location dot works equals, and then the path. The path here is my downloads location slash works slash, well, XAA is one file. So I can run this command and it is going to start processing XAA. So basically what I've done here is by specifying this at runtime, I'm having this specific property data dump dot location dot works to be overridden. And it's not going to be what's in my application dot YAML anymore. It's going to be this file. So this gives me the flexibility to basically run this program with multiple of these arguments passed. So I can have like 10 of these run at the same time and provide these different files so that they're going to process 10 files in parallel. And before I run this, I'm going to create a script file so that I can put all those commands here. I'm going to create a file called script.st. And then I'm going to open this in Visual Studio Code again. And over here, I'm going to copy this command. Paste this here, and then this is going to have an ampersand at the end so that this can run in parallel. I want all of these to run in parallel and not have to wait for another one, all right? So here I'm going to copy this and paste this so that there are 10 of them. And then I'm going to change the last letters of these okay so this is oh I just realized i have a typo here this should be spring boot all right so i'm going to save and close this i'm going to switch back to the uh terminal and i'm going to change this permissions of this thing to be executable. All right, so I'm going to do chmod plus x script.sh so that it is an executable now. And now we should be able to run the script and it's basically going to send all of this data to Cassandra and it's going to do like 10 different threads at the same time. So it's going to be bombarding uh, Cassandra with this data. You ready to run it? Well, I'm ready. Let's give it a shot. All right, so it's happening in the background. We see all these different uh, threads that are running and uh, it's all of them are sending data out. Well, not yet. They're in the process of sending data out. The Spring Boot application has started. And here you go. All of the books are being sent out and it's going at a pretty rapid pace. I have uh, caught exceptions. I've kind of swallowed exceptions. So I noticed that some of them are failing, which is fine. Uh, we might miss out on like a few books, but with the amount of data at the scale, I really cannot get into each and every one of those and try and troubleshoot and see what's happening. I'm just going to let it rip through the whole data set 
And um, as you can imagine, this our database is handling it pretty well, right? It's a good amount of data that we are sending. Uh, and Cassandra is going to basically take that all in, create those records, and uh, we will have all of the books in the world available in our database. And again, like I mentioned, I'm going through this whole data set and uploading it because I'm crazy. You don't have to do this. I have curated a portion of this data, a small set that you can use for testing purposes, have something available in the database if you're following along. You don't have to upload every book ever written. All right, you don't need to do it. You can if you want to, but you don't need to do this, not for the scope of the, the coding itself, all right? So with this, I'm going to wrap up the series. I hope you had fun. I hope you had fun watching. I hope you had fun coding along. Uh, watch out for more of these series coming up on uh, the Gemma Brains channel. I hope you learned something from this. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.